What do you have to experience before you can say, finally, I'm living? What do you think living really is? The only thing that makes sense is what Paul says. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The more you live for him, the more you realize, I'm so thankful I don't have to know that I'm not in charge, that it's Christ who's leading. I'm so thankful that he's the one that gives joy and peace. Because Jesus is the key to joy. I'm sure you guys know it's no secret that our culture is in the midst of some radical changes, right? I mean, rem remember when we dealt with the basic issues like divorce and gun control and abortion and anthrax and Israeli-Palestinian uprisings and nuclear power <laughs> and religious freedoms? Remember we just had to deal with those? Now, they haven't gone away, but now we've got other things that we've added to it, like global warming and marijuana legalization, transgender rights, LGBTQQAS. We've got things like immigration, border control, reform, uh, woke awareness, opioid, fentanyl, overdose, critical race theory, open city anarchy, teen suicide, mass shoot. You say, John, this doesn't sound like the key to joy. <laughs> ah! It's just almost too much to absorb, you know, that the, the happenings and things that are going on in our culture and the things that we're dealing with and the political issues that are going on. And it's just a multiplication of confusion, controversy, and conflict. I had a guy call me the other day. He doesn't come to church here. He used to. He says, I work for this company, so-and-so. You know the mandate. It's the, he said, it's the vax or the ax. And I said, yeah, I know. So, so that whole confusion's going on, and, and we're, you know, we're just dealing with all of it, not to mention, you know, your own personal struggles, you know, the, the constant battle with self-control, you know, the, the, the issues of family relationships and kids and earning a living and health, and, and, and here's the thing, the beat goes on and on and on. It's just, it's life. You know, my wife and I were talking this morning, and uh, she, she, she was, uh, he, he, uh, you, you know, you marry opposites, right? You just do. It's the way it works. <laughs> so in the morning, I'm kind of quiet. I like to sort of just meander around, do my own thing, you know, uh, leave me alone for about 20 minutes, let me wake up, have some coffee, and Lynn likes to spring out of bed, and, hey, how you doing? <laughs> and I'm like... So, so this morning we're talking, and, and she, 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 I go, are you okay? She goes, well, I like to talk in the morning. And I go, oh. <laughs> so are you okay? And, and, and somehow we got on this word annoying. And somehow some things are annoying. And when you start thinking about it, everything's annoying. <laughs> that red light's annoying. That person's annoying. You're annoying. Everything's annoying. And all that's going on in our culture is so annoying at times. And in the book of Philippians, there are some things going on in Paul's heart and his mind that were conflicting and annoying. And we ended really with verse 1 last week that kind of goes with chapter 3. But there's, there's these two ladies in the church that are annoying. They're in conflict, and everyone in the church knows it. The Apostle Paul knows it. There's this lady, Udiah and Synchony, and, and he says in verse 2 of chapter 4, I implore you, it's, it's like he's, he's like demanding and begging at the same time, to be of the same mind and the Lord. Every, everyone in the body knows, in the church knows, that these two people, these two women are at odds with one another and have a conflict and a broken relationship. It's impacting the whole group. And, and Paul's basically saying to them, uh, can't you just agree? Can't you come together on this? And, and, and he's writing to a church where there's interpersonal conflict 
and problems. He's already shared in chapter 3, verse 18, if you can direct your eye to verse 18 of chapter 3, for many, and this is people in and out of the church walk and talking about living a lifestyle of whom I've told you often, and now I'll tell you even weeping, that they're enemies of the cross of Christ. Paul is mostly impacted by this church and what people are doing and the conflict that's going on and the lifestyles that are coming in and out of it. So he's dealing with a congregation where relationships are impacting him and others. Professing Christians are, are demonstrating a lifestyle that are, well, it's ungodly and destructive. And Paul himself, I mean, think about this, he's in prison. In chapter 1, he mentions his chains. So he's got this whole issue going on in his life and in this church. And so Paul's going to give some direction to those in Philippi, and I believe to you and I, in the culture we live in, in the situations we deal with, about how to have peace in the midst of change and in the midst of conflict. One of the things I believe about peace in your life is that you have to build a foundation in order to have it. You know, everything in life, it seems... Starts with a foundation. A home, if you build one, you've got to start with a foundation. Jesus talked about, you know, those who build their home on this kind of foundation, the storms will come and it'll last. A business, if you're going to start a business, you better build it on a foundation so that when tough times come and, and, and if you're going to be successful with it, you've got something that you've built that you can rely on, it won't fall apart. A marriage. Better build it on love and respect, and don't be annoying to one another. You know, just, just, just make sure it's being done right, and it'll last. But Paul is, is going to talk about, in this few nine verses that we have, about peace in the midst of conflict, not about life without conflict, not about living in a way without problems, because that kind of life doesn't exist. Here is an imprisoned believer in chains, a pastor, Paul is, writing to a church with conflict, broken relationships, people living in a way that's opposed to the Christ that creates emotion within him. He's facing possible execution. And so I, I, I say all that to say this, this is not some guy in an office, you know, listening to soft, easy music talking about theories or coming up with thoughts while he's sipping his chai latte. The the Apostle Paul himself, all through his walk with the Lord and trek with the Lord, so to speak, he knows hardship, knows conflict, and he knows how to live peacefully in the midst of it. So he's going to talk to us about peace. And and I'm sure you probably know this, that the Hebrew word for peace is the word shalom. If you go to Israel or if you're around Jewish people, I'm sure you've heard the word shalom. It's used as a greeting. It's also used as a farewell, shalom. Now, Now, even though the word means peace, the real root of the word is if someone says to you shalom... It really means that they're hoping that everything in your life is exactly as it should be, that it may, you may be at peace. Shalom. When God created the world, He made everything good. He made everything as it should be. The world was at shalom. It was at peace. There was man and woman, they were at peace with one another, that they walked with God in the garden in the cool of the evening, they were rightly related with God, they were rightly related related to the creation, they experienced joy and satisfaction, fulfillment and relationship, everything was shalom, everything was as it should be. And you know the story, 
disobedience, sin enters in, and then nothing was as it should be. The relationship between God and man was broken. The relationship between man and woman was broken. This, this woman that you, that you gave me, the, but between their own hearts, things were broken. Knowing now that they had sinned and were guilty and ashamed. And, and the great story of the Bible is this amazing story of God making things again as they should be through His Son, Jesus Christ. Restoring the relationship between God and man through His Son. Making a way for things to be right between one another through forgiveness and the Lord. And the way to restore our own hearts so the shame and the guilt and the loneliness can be filled with a relationship by Him and through Him. And even one day, He'll make everything right here on earth. There'll be a new heaven, there'll be a new earth, and all things will be as they ought to be. There'll be shalom. And so this is the kind of peace that, that Paul is talking about, that, that everything can be as it should be in your heart and in your life. A foundation has to be laid. So here in Philippians, uh, Paul shows us how this peace comes into our lives and how things ought to be as they should be, even in the midst of conflict, confusion, and controversy. And, and here's, the, here's the very first level of the foundation. Let me draw your attention back to chapter 4. We, we pick it up with verse 4. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I say, what, what does that mean? What does that look like? And speaking of, of, of peace and, and restoration, rejoice in the Lord. And, and again, I say rejoice. Well, I, I would submit to you that, that he's, he's talking about having an open, loving relationship with God and taking joy in what he's done and who he is. See, see, here's the scenario. It's Adam and Eve before the fall. Man, they're enjoying all that God has done. All that God is. There's freedom. There, there's beauty. They're walking with him personally, relationally. And then the disobedience occurs. Rebellion. And what happens? They hide. They hide from God. And, and, and they're no longer near God. They're no longer able to, to openly meet with God and rejoice in what He is and all that He's done and who He's come to be to them. So, so God comes calling. God, God comes looking. Adam, where are you? Adam. He's afraid. A A Adam has lost his shalom. He's lost his peace. At one time, everything was as it should be. Now it's not. It's upside down. He, he, he's hiding from God, and, and he's ashamed. He's fearful. And I would say this. Without an open relationship with the Lord, you cannot and will not know real peace. This is why he starts off by saying, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say, Rejoice, because you can't really rejoice in the Lord till you come out from your hiding, out from your darkness, say, okay, Lord, here I am. This is who I really am. This is what I need from you. I, I, I come out of my darkness. You know, man loves darkness, so he hides out in it, and, and he, he comes calling us into the light so that we might be able to begin build this foundation of peace in our life, which begins with a loving relationship, or to put it in Paul's word, to rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord, and again I say rejoice. It's pretty hard to rejoice in the Lord when you're walking in disobedience. In the book of Isaiah, I'll just read a passage. I'm sure you've heard it before. It says this, The wicked, those who live in darkness, who hide from the Lord, are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest whose waters cast up mire 
and dirt. And it says, there's no peace, says my God, for them. I'm sure you've seen, been out to the Gulf of Mexico or to the ocean when there's a storm and, you know, the surf is coming in all different directions and it's churning up all the sand and it's murky. And, and he says, that's the life, that's the inward life of those who choose that kind of lifestyle and there's no peace. It's like it's a constant turmoil. And the great invitation of the gospel is Jesus comes to you and to me and he says, hey, hey, come home. Come out of your darkness. Come out of those things you know that are wrong, those things that are bringing destruction into your life. Come out of the darkness, like God coming to Adam, Jesus comes to us, and he knocks, and he calls, and he seeks. He, he said of himself, you know, I've come to seek and to save those who have got lost in the darkness. And so he calls us to come into a life of rejoicing in the Lord, and a restored relationship with the Lord so we don't have to hide anymore. See, here's, here's the big question that, that comes out of the gospel, that comes out of a person who, who wants peace. And we certainly are, once again, in the midst of a culture of conflict and controversy and chaos. Have you come to Him? Have you heard His voice calling you and come out of the shadows have you come out of that way of living in disobedience and saying, okay, Lord, what I would love to do is have peace. I would love to be able to wake up in the morning and say, Lord, I can rejoice in you. And again, I say, rejoice. And I would say that he never stops calling you out of the darkness. This process of Christianity called sanctification where he's transforming your life and and so first I submit to you that peace the foundation of it comes with a genuine obedient relationship with the Lord you must leave the darkness behind the hiding so to speak whatever that secret sin or thing might be so that you can rejoice in the Lord and then he goes on First, there is this open relationship with the Lord, which is the beginning of the foundation of peace. And then he says in verse 5, Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Now, we know it's not possible to be in relationship with everybody in a way that's right. Even Jesus said, love your enemies. And what he implied by that is, you'll have enemies, right? So we've all got them. Uh, you know, I wish all things were as they should be with everyone I know. I wish we could all live in a way where we could say, hey, how's everything with everybody? Oh, it's shalom. It's as it ought to be. But we know there's conflict, and it's a two-way street. And some people drive in the other lane, and they're crazy, right? They're nuts. They're always getting in your lane in front of you. They're annoying. But you and I are called to be peacemakers. And it's, it's part of who we are called to be. It's part of this, it's part of this foundation of peace. In, in the book of Romans, chapter 12, it says this. It says... If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. So we're called, as he says here in chapter 4 of Philippians, let your gentleness be made known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Basically, he's saying be kind. And you will lay a path for peace with yourself and with others. Peace with God, open relationship with Him, peace with others, pursuing peace in a relationship. And he uses this word, here's an interesting word, it's the word gentleness in verse 5. And you read that and you kind of think, well, that's kind of wimpy, that's kind of soft. What does that mean? He says here, you know, 
let your gentleness be made known to all men. Well, I want to illustrate this word, and I think this captures the meaning of it in, in the text, with your car. Everybody who has a car has these things installed by the wheels called shock absorbers. And they, they absorb the shock of potholes and bumps and uh, speed, speed ramps and uh, rough spots. Without them, you have a very difficult, uncomfortable ride. Well, gentleness is the shock absorber uh, of the spirit, so to speak. And, and what he's saying is, and, and, and you'll see how this ties together in a minute with this, this foundation of peace. Be willing to give. Be, be willing to flex. Don't, don't be so rigid with people. Don't, don't be so stiff and, and harsh, unwilling to bend. Paul says, absorb some of the stuff that comes your way. He, he puts it like this, you know, let your gentleness be known to all men. Well, I don't want to talk to that guy. He's just going to unload on me. He, he says, no, ab- absorb some of that. You don't have to be on the attack all the time. You don't, you don't have to win every argument. You don't have to always get your way in conflict. Anybody ever have conflict? In conflict, think of some reasons, some excuses, some possible issues that might cause the other person's behavior to be the way it is, instead of just looking through your lens. I I like this statement. I don't know where I heard it, but I heard it a long time ago. Give some space for grace. Give some space for grace. Everybody's dealing with something. I, I remember the story about a pastor. He had a large staff, and he had one uh, person on his staff that was uh, very connected, and he was a leader, and, and everybody was being impacted by this person's attitude, being impacted by this person's sort of uh, inability to get along with everyone else. And, and the pastor was trying to get rid of him. It was just a, it was a drain on the, on the whole staff. And, and eventually this person, instead of firing him, he got sick and, and he died. And when they did the autopsy, they, they found out, true story, that he had a, a tumor, a, a large tumor in his brain. And they, 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 by the size of it, they estimated and, and realized that about the time that he started being difficult and, and un, had the inability to get along with others, was about the time that the tumor probably started growing in his brain. And I say that to say this. There may be things you don't know about other people in your life that's creating conflict between you and them. There may be things that you need to say, you know what, I need to absorb a little of this. I need to let my gentleness be at hand. I, I, I need to maybe let it be a little bumpy and have shock absorbers in my spirit. I mean, think about Jesus being beaten and crucified. And, and, and he's our great example. He's our great illustration. And, and Jesus goes, Father, forgive them. <laughs> they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. And sometimes I think we've got to look at people and go, Ah, Father... Forgive them. I don't really think they know what they're doing. I don't think they really know the impact they're having on me or the situation I'm in. He's defending, Jesus is defending those who are offending him. That's some pretty powerful stuff. No matter how right your cause might be, and I know your cause is always right. Don't justify a harsh spirit. You will lose your peace. You will lose your peace. Now now in verse 6, he's laying a foundation first for a, a, a relationship with God. Rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. 
a relationship with others. And now he begins to deal with our own hearts, getting that settled, getting that right. And in verse 6, he begins by saying this, Be anxious for, for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now, anxiety is a powerful thing. It's a huge thing in our culture right now. And for some reason, I don't know if you found this to be true, but anxiety is extremely productive late at night. Have you found that to be true? It's like it all starts coming in on you. My, my wife and I sometimes will be talking about something, and you go, you know what, let's don't, let's don't think about this till, till tomorrow. Because for some reason it's just productive at night. And so Paul says, don't be anxious. And then he gives us a way to fight against anxiety. To fight against fear. Paul says, here's your first way to fight it. He says, pray. He says, pray. And you might be sitting here today and think, John, I pray, but you know... Uh, I still have anxiety. I'm not talking about panic prayer. I'm not talking about last minute or some desperate wringing of the hands and, oh God, if you only... No, I'm not talking about that kind of pray. I'm talking about the kind of prayer where you enter into His presence, feeling, filling your heart and mind, first of all. This is a great way to enter into prayer. Filling your heart, I'm trying to lay a foundation for peace. Filling your heart and mind with who He is. Starting there. It's kind of like um, once in a while, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a good grill guy, right? I mean, I, I have a, a, a green egg, if you know what that is. I think, I've never figured it out and I've had it for 12 years. So I'll go out there. I can never get to the right temperature, but I clean it. I, I, I'm, let's go back to this story. So, so once in a while, we'll buy some steaks and we'll grill them. Well, Lynn likes this certain kind of uh, marinating sauce, this Dale's steak sauce. So she's got this Tupperware thing with little bumps in the bottom of it, and she'll lay it in there, she'll pour the stuff all over, and you've got to turn it over, and you've got to shake it, and you've got to get it just right. And it, and it, it uh, absorbs into the meat, and it permeates the entire steak. And, and prayer is you, be, you coming before the Lord marinating your mind, letting your mind be completely permeated with who He is. Prayer begins like this. Not with me panicking, wringing my hands. Oh God, you better... No, it's coming into His presence. Okay, God, first of all, I recognize You're sovereign. You're in control. God, I, I recognize You're with me and You're good. I recognize You're gracious, You're merciful. I, I just began to think about all the great truths in the Bible of who God is and His character, which has been proven over the years. And then He says, you know, in, in this passage, be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer. Start with prayer. Supplication and prayer is bringing your requests. And here's one thing I've learned about prayer, and hopefully it's something that, that sticks in my life and is a part of this foundation of peace, that when you come to the Lord with a request, let it be a request. Let it be specific. Tell the Lord the same stuff you're telling your friends that you're fearful over. They don't want to hear it anymore, so tell Him. <laughs> Open up. Open up your life to the Lord. Don't, don't hide what's bothering you. Put, it, put words to it and do it with thanksgiving. Lord, here it is. And express thanksgiving. God, I thank you that, that, and I'm grateful that you're hearing. I know that you're going you're gonna to respond to me. I, I, I'm yours. You're mine. And, and, and the anxiety you have in your heart that, that's there, you just begin to just open it up to the light of his character and who he is, and you begin to share it with thanksgiving. Paul says, build a relationship with God. He starts this way. Rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. You know, let everything be as it should be with Him. 
Show gentleness to others in this crazy culture. Pray, speaking your mind in the reality of who God is and bring your specific fears and anxieties to Him in prayer. Bring them out of the shadows. And he says here, and, 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 and the peace of God, verse 7, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. B build this foundation. It starts with an open relationship with God. It starts by, by putting on these shock absorbers in your spirit with other people so you're not always in conflict with them, recognizing that you have a part to play in that as much as possible, live at peace with all people, and then come before the Lord with, with prayer and, and thanksgiving. Uh, we, we, we want this peace. We want this calm. And there needs to be a foundation that it's built on. It's not a quick fix. It's something that you develop in your life through this, through these, through this process of Scripture and knowing Him. It, it, it's a byproduct of walking in an obedient, open relationship with God, characterized by being gentle with others because you're in touch with Him and He's guiding and leading. And it involves authentic prayer, addressing real-life issues in my life and the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You'll find a peace that passes understanding. And if ever there was a time in your life and my life and the life of our culture that we need peace, it's now. Many times we lack peace because we're not in an open, obedient relationship with God. And we're just hiding most of the time. And so he's calling. Can't rejoice in him when we're being disobedient and, and harsh in relationships with other people. And if you really examine prayer, is it real prayer? Or is it just a pretty minimal thing in your life? Paul says in the midst of conflict, and he starts this chapter off talking about conflict. These ladies in the church, the issues with those who are living lifestyles, dressing those things that bring difficulty, controversy, chaos. He says, begin to build a foundation in your life for peace. Rejoice in the Lord. In other words, you could put it this way. Be committed to Him. Be obedient to him, so you can truly rejoice in him. Be, be a gentle shock absorber, and it will, it will be something that all can see. Now bring your anxiety and fears to the Lord in prayer. Be, be real. Paul, with a, with a broken, weeping heart, dealing with conflict, living himself in chains and in a Roman prison, says you, I mean, isn't this, this is amazing. He says you can have peace that passes understanding. And then kind of as a bonus, he goes on to say as we close it out, he says, turn off media, Netflix, Hulu, <laughs> Amazon, and he says, whatever things, verse 8, are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure and lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, then, then start meditating on these things. It, it, if you can lay this foundation and then turn your mind towards those things that, that are characterized by this, the things which you've learned and received, verse 9, and heard and you saw in me, he says, these do. And then he says, the God of Shalom, as things ought to be, will be with you. What an amazing promise. What an amazing pattern and process that he lays out for us. Here's a guy in prison with his hands chained, dealing with churches that have conflict where people who are free. And he says, I want to help you build a foundation for Paul. Paul's certainly not without peace, and he's in prison. And so he says to you and I, who are dealing with all kinds of issues in our life today, as we extract this out of Scripture, he says, let me help you lay a foundation, not to build a new home, although 
that might be something you're doing. Our new business, our marriage. But let me help you have things as they ought to be with God, with one another, with your own heart. And then one day God will make all things right here on earth. But he lays this beautiful foundation for you and I to experience peace that passes understanding. Like, God, I don't know how I got this peace. I don't understand. He goes, well, because you, first of all, came out of hiding. And then he began to realize that, that people are not your problem. And then you begin to realize that there's a way to pray, not just throwing up petitions in the midst of panic. And you come to find that when you step into that reality, that the God of Shalom can be with you. And I would submit to you, more than ever, in my life and in your life, we need what Paul describes here. The God of peace will be with you. To that I say...